Today, we're continuing in part two of a brand new series we're going through called Rebuilding. We're going through the book of Ephesians. Last week, Pastor Steve led us through chapter one. Today, we're going to look at chapter two. Now listen, if you're watching today and you don't typically check uh, out this website, you're not normally watching this stream and, and you've sort of just stumbled upon it or maybe a friend shared it with you and you're just sort of watching here today, maybe you don't even follow Jesus. You're not even sure you want to follow Jesus. I'm glad that you're here And if you ever feel that prompting, sort of that draw, sort of that attraction toward Jesus, and you're wondering, what is that all about? Why do I occasionally feel a draw? The verse we're going to look at today explains exactly what it is that Jesus is doing in your heart and mind when we feel that draw. See, the thing we're going to look at today is the deepest longing, the deepest craving in every human heart. And I'm so excited, but I just also want to talk to those of you who typically do go to Calvary. And here's the reality. As we look at this familiar passage today, I want you to do something. And instead of just agreeing with it, would you take a really bold, courageous step and right now pray, God, would you reveal one step you want me to personally take in the verses that we're going to look at today? I think he has something for you today. Will you be ready to receive it when he reveals it to you today? You see, here's a quote that absolutely haunts me as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's a quote by Gandhi when he says, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. We're going to look at a passage today that challenges us to be different and to be more like him. I hope you'll follow along. But let me give you a warning because as we look at it today, Paul right out of the gate in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul who writes what we're about to look at, he comes out with a couple of one-two punches that are absolutely hard to hear. So hang in there because good news is coming, but the first three verses, well, they're a little bit hard to hear. So let's just jump right in. Watch what Paul begins and watch what he says. Right out of the gate, here in Ephesians chapter 2, he writes, As for you, you were dead. Dead. Like that feels bad to hear and even maybe a little offensive. Bad, but the reality is Paul wants to set something up to say that the good news of Jesus, the good news is so, so good when we realize that the bad news is so, so bad, that we were dead. Now, it's offensive only if it isn't true. I think about it, when you go to the doctor and you're in the doctor's office and the doctor gives you hard, maybe bad news, we recognize that it's hard, but it's only offensive if it isn't true. So the question is, Is this true? Are we dead? So we've got to ask Paul, well, Paul, how do we know this is true? What are some symptoms that reveal if this is really true and we all are born into this dead status? And look what Paul says. He's about to reveal, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. These are the symptoms, according to Paul, in which you used to live. Now, sometimes when we see the word sins, we think Oh, that's the fun stuff God wants me to stop doing. And that isn't at all what Paul is talking about. Instead, what Paul is talking about is there are tendencies in our life to do things that lead us to death and destruction. There are tendencies in our life to look for comfort that harms me and maybe those around me. There's a tendency in my life to look for security in things that can harm me and those around me. There's a tendency for me in my identity to do things that will harm me and those around me. It'll lead to death and destruction. Now, you may be thinking, why in the world would anyone do anything that could lead to harm? Why would anyone intentionally do anything that could eventually hurt them or those around them that leads to death and destruction? What would possibly influence us to do something so illogical? And that's what Paul's about to talk about. Look what he says. This is our influence. When you followed the ways of this world, 
Now, what's the world when Paul talks about it? He's, the, he's really revealing something significant, that there is a stream of thought. There are patterns, there are beliefs, there's a perspective in our world. We see it all the time. You ever notice how our social media influencers or how our music or our, the, mu- the movies that we download all have this stream of thought, this set of beliefs, this set of thinking, this pattern or perspective that's very similar Paul calls that the world. And then he says, here is who's influencing the world or the stream of thought. It's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Meaning Satan himself is actually influencing the stream of thought that's all around us, that's influencing us toward patterns of destruction and death. And he goes on to say, it's the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now you might be thinking, well, who are those people? Who are the disobedient people? Who are the guilty people? That Paul's talking, I'm not guilty. Maybe it's, you're thinking, maybe it's the person you're watching this stream with. Like maybe she's guilty, maybe he's guilty, but I'm not. Who is it that Paul's talking about is guilty? Who is it that he's saying is dead? And watch the next three words. He says, all of us. No one gets a free pass. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. And watch this. He gives some profound insight. Watch what he says. And following its desires and thoughts. Following its desires and thoughts. Have you noticed, maybe in this season, you're at home more, and yet you have these desires that don't make any sense. Maybe you've had some old desires come back up. Maybe you're tempted to click on that link, and you're thinking, I know this goes down a pathway I don't want to go down, and yet I still have a desire to do it. There's this stream, this desire to go in a direction that I know will harm me. Or maybe you're thinking, hey, I'm in this place where I'm comparing myself. I'm tempted to go down that comparative trap where I want to compare myself to her or to him. And I begin to think, I don't know if I'm as good as, as smart as. And we know that doesn't lead anywhere good. And yet we're still tempted to go down that pathway. Or maybe it's your thoughts. You you realize that sometimes you have these thoughts where you're thinking things that you know aren't true. You're doubting the goodness of God. You're doubting whether or not you're lovable. You're doubting whether or not anyone is capable of loving you. And you have these doubts and these thoughts and these desires has ever dawned on you. What Paul is revealing in this passage is some of our desires we didn't author. Some of our thoughts we didn't author. They're from someone else who's planning a desire, planning a thought within us. We all have that. And maybe this is the season where we would go, what is the desire or the thought that I'm struggling with in this season? And maybe you would just take it before the Lord today. Maybe you would invite your group into it or someone that you have an accountable relationship with who can pray with you. You don't have to carry that alone. We all have that. We're all dead in our trespasses and sins. He's about to give us some hope, but here's the truth. The desires and thoughts will still be there. And Paul is reminding us who authors that and that we are to be aware of it. Now, in case you're tempted to think, well, I don't know if that's so bad to go down that road toward desires and thoughts. Maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not going to be that consequential. Watch what Paul says the consequences actually are. He goes on to say, all of us, that's us, lived among them, gratifying the flesh, following its desires and thoughts. And then he says, like the rest, all of us, we were by nature deserving, and here's the consequence, wrath. Think of a God who's so sovereign who could create the earth, who can create the complexity bodies that we experience as humanity, who holds the solar system in its place. Imagine that God with his wrath, the capacity. This is a scary revelation that Paul shares. Here's the really bad news right out of the gate of chapter 2. We are all dead. We're born unto death, and there's nothing we can do about it. And I don't know about you, but I am really glad this letter and this chapter doesn't end here. I'm glad we don't have to end this message here. But instead, if there were a track, a soundtrack playing behind this chapter, the chords would go from a minor chord to a major chord. The tempo would pick up a little bit. And all of a sudden, we would begin to feel hope because what's about to happen is one of the greatest transitions in Scripture where we see so much bad, bad news that we're about to go to such great, great news. And it begins right in verse 4. Watch these next few words of hope. He says, but because of his great love, For us, 
Now, this is really personal. You could insert your name right here. You could say, because of his great love for Mark, put your name right there. Because of his great love for you. God loves you. Yes, you were dead in trespasses and sin. Yes, you followed the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Yes, you have these desires and thoughts. He sees it all, knows it all. And yet because of his great love for you, here we see this incredible idea that Paul, despite his condition, is able to remember and focus on the great love of God. And I can't help but think of how profound this is because remember, when we look at the book of Ephesians, Paul, who was writing this book, this letter to a group of people in Ephesians or in Ephesus there in modern day Turkey, he himself is imprisoned in Rome. He himself is sitting on a Roman prison floor writing this letter and instead of focusing on his injustice, instead of focusing on his hardship, instead of focusing on his desire to be free, he writes to free people to remind them to focus on God's great love. I don't know about you, but when I'm in the middle of struggling with something, I tend to focus on my Goliath more than my God. I tend to focus on a dream and it becomes this giant in front of me and I want to pursue it and I go, oh, that's my Goliath and I focus on it more than my God. And here, Paul, back in the Roman prison cell, that's his Goliath, but instead he keeps his eyes focused on the great love for God. I want to ask you, what is the Goliath in your life right now that you're tempted as you wake up at three in the morning, it's on your mind, that you continually have your eyes focused on? Could you take the encouragement from Paul and instead focus on his great love? Now, if you're wondering what is so great about his love, Paul is about to reveal two specific words that reveal what makes his love to you so great. Look at the next passage. It says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in, and here's the first word, mercy. Now, what is mercy and why does that relate to us in the 21st century? Mercy is not receiving what I deserve. Not receiving what I do. Deserve. What is it that we deserve? Well, we just saw it in verse 3. We deserve wrath. Cosmic, divine, sovereign, God's wrath. But here we're revealed, uh, Paul reveals that because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, meaning he makes a way through his son Jesus on the cross to pay the penalty of my sins and yours, of my desires, of my temptations, of my following the ways of the world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Because of all that in me, something had to be, someone had to pay the price for a holy, just God to have that satisfied. And it was the only one who could provide the payment. And that's God himself in Jesus. His mercy makes a way out for me, but it doesn't end there. He does something. He not only withholds his wrath, he does something specific. Watch what he does. He made us alive. He made us alive with Christ. At the end of the day, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are dead people and there are rescued people. He makes us alive. It turns out good people don't go to heaven. Rescued people go to heaven. And God, in his great love, in his great mercy, he makes a way of escape and he rescues us. And those rattling bones come to life again. You say, well, how does he do that? What is the transition from death to life? What is the transition from his mercy? What's the other word? What is it that's so great about his love? And watch the rest of this verse. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. That's what he talked about in the first three verses in transgressions. And here it is. Here's the doorway. Here's the opening. It is by grace you have been saved or you have been rescued. Mercy and now his grace. Now what is mercy is not receiving what we deserve, but grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Because of Jesus on the cross, we are going to, re, we are going to discover that Jesus' death on the cross gives us something we don't deserve. In fact, he doesn't just want us to rest in being rescued. He wants us to revel in the relationship with him. 
And I don't know about you, but I am tempted so much in this salvation experience to be made alive and to celebrate that he rescued me. And then I want to return to the stream and continue doing life with the same perspective and battle every once in a while with a verse or with a church service. And, but I'm kind of doing streams celebrating that I've been rescued. And Paul's revealing there's so much more. He doesn't just want to rescue me. He wants a relationship with me. He wants to enter in on a daily, moment by moment relationship with me. And yes, he celebrates rescuing, but because of his grace, he wants to give us something we don't deserve. And that's communion with him. That's a relationship with him. And here's something powerful. When we surrender to that relationship, watch what happens to me and to you. It says, and God raised us up. When we surrender to his mercy and grace, he not only takes us from death to life, he not only rescues us with his mercy and grace, but he, he doesn't tweak us. He doesn't like shift us in the stream. He pulls us out. He raises us up. He resurrects us. We are new creations. We are completely made over, transformed with Christ, and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, I love this, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. And you say, what does that look like? Where did that come from? It's expressed in God's kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's as if God got with Jesus and said, I've got an idea. Together, let's produce grace. Incomparable grace. The opportunity for people to be completely transformed from a Roman jail cell. Paul is able to say, this is his great love for you. And today, it's still being offered to you today. It transforms. But here's what I love about it. It also unites us. I mean, think about this. No other organization, no other religion is able to come together. We can worship with people we completely disagree with. The grace of God allows us to worship with people who have a completely politically different view on this world. We can come together no matter what our theology is, no matter where our level of holiness is, no matter our ethnicity, no matter our nationality, no matter where our values are, we gather under the umbrella of this incomparable grace. This unites us, and when we worship together, we disagree fine, but we come together, and the tip of the spear is the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't want us to miss his great love. Now, watch, though, how we discover who, what our part in this grace formula is. It is by grace that you have been saved or you have been rescued, I have been rescued, and he's offering this to any of us who would surrender to him. Through faith, meaning we can't talk our way into this, we can't think our way into this, we can go so far and at some point we take a step of trust. And this is not from yourselves, so we have no part in this. It is a gift of God, not by works or by our works, so that no one can boast. It turns out our part, in this process is to open our hands and surrender to a merciful God who offers us grace. He wants to do more than just rescue us, though. He wants to have a relationship with us. Now, I don't know about you, but I love stories of life change because of this grace. Paul spent his life pursuing people who would be open to the draw of Jesus, the draw of the Spirit toward this life-changing grace. And so today, I want you to hear a story of grace. Today, I want to invite my friend Chris Evan, who is here at Calvary. He's been on staff for about five years. And Chris has been leading us in worship today. And Chris, good to see you, man. I'd give you a hello, but we're going to do this. Keep that six feet. Yeah, and it's so exciting just to be here with you. And... Uh, Thanks for taking a minute. Thank you, Danny. So tell us a little bit about your story. I know it began with you in church, of all places. Um, tell us about your story. 
Yeah, so I, I grew up in the area, and I grew up going to Catholic school, Catholic church, high school, all that Sunday school. And the best way I describe it is I knew of God, hmm. but I didn't really know God personally. I'd never encountered him. And what that meant is as my life went on, I was kind of that seed that stayed and came and snatched up a little bit. You know, hmm. that just that knowledge of God didn't hold up. And yeah. At a certain yeah. point in my life, there was uh, what seemed like an orchestrated diversion of my heart hmm. away from the Lord. Hmm. And, um, you know, just like most of us, I was I was hurt in different ways through my life, hmm. emotionally, um, physically. And in that pain I was carrying, uh, I also just started getting exposed to like different ways of coping in that pain. Hmm. And when the pain I was holding on to and carrying intersected uh temporary relief in the form of drugs and alcohol it kind of created this tornado of destruction mm. in my life mm. that just got worse and worse and worse and worse and mm. um, everything kind of de- really uh, progressed quickly and yeah. before I knew it um, I was having to use drugs and alcohol every day just mm. to just to make it through the day just mm. to feel all right and um, it just it just got really really bad really really quick did you struggle at all with your um, what you knew about God and, you know, you, you, did you feel like you lost faith in any way? Did you feel like you just wanted to throw that away? I mean, what did that look like for you in that season? Yeah. As, as I started to get deeper and deeper in, into darkness, I really started mm. to question things. And mm. I think I was just under the influence of so many different things. So I started to search, um, for answers in other places and mm. different sort, forms of spirituality. And I, I basically completely lost my faith. There was a time mm. in my life, um, after hearing all about God that I decided that I, I didn't believe uh, mm. that God was real. And then you had, through these years of, of just wrestling and struggling, you said it before, it was almost like God wouldn't leave you alone. And there was a moment specifically that was pretty powerful in your life as you were telling your story to me. Uh, would you tell us about that moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so long story short, just a, a, a lot of uh, circumstances uh, just put me in a place where um, I started to open up back mm. to the idea of God. Mm. And a lot of that revolved around here at Calvary. Mm. And um, at a certain point, I began to, to pray and ask God that um, he give me a sign. If, mm. if he was calling me, give me a sign if he wanted me to change my life in any way. And mm. uh, eventually, three days later, um, while partying, I, I blacked out, mm. uh, ended up on a roof, ended up falling off that roof, mm. uh, in a scuffle with somebody. And mm. I wound up in the hospital. And while I was in the hospital, uh, I heard the woman next to me just crying out to the doctors in tears, mm. uh, asking for help because she couldn't stop drinking. She couldn't control her drinking. Mm. And here I was in the hospital and I, that just caught my ear. And I realized, and this, this woman is suffering from exactly what I'm suffering. And mm. as soon as I started to think about that, it, I, the best way I can explain it is there's just a, a rush of wind of like God's presence. And like, mm. I felt so whole and comforted and warm. And it, it's wow. just like, it's just like someone that I didn't know, but I knew all my life was there and wow. I could recognize him for the first time. And in that moment, I just, I just heard him say that it was time to change and that wow. he loved me and he was there for me. And, uh, wow. I, I surrendered to him right there in the, wow. in the hospital room. That was your moment. That's powerful, Chris. So you have this surrender and we're on this side now. I'm guessing life hasn't always been easy since you had that moment of surrender. What's God teaching you now all these years later? How's your relationship with God going? It's, it's, been, it's been a real journey. I start, yeah. I start to realize that uh, just like God wasn't abandoning me and leaving me behind in my sin before, it's the same, it's the same now. Um, mm. It's not like he snapped his fingers right there in the hospital room and I, I became the man I am today and yeah. will be in the future. It's a, yeah. a step-by-step thing. And the best way uh, I can think of it is that following him and surrendering to him is not a performance that I do. It's mm. a decision I continually make. I love that. Um, wow. I'm just continually turning my heart back to him and repenting when he, when he yeah. calls me. I love that feels true. That feels real. Um, we are saved to good works. The next verse that we didn't look at, uh, today, and you are such a great example of that, Chris, you are a great example of not only being saved by his grace, but living out grace in your life. I can't help but think though, I, somebody is watching right now who 
can so relate to your story. And just like God was after you and God revealed himself and drew you to him, I know someone is experiencing and feeling that same thing, being drawn by God right now. And I know you prayed a prayer of surrender. Maybe somebody's on their similar rock bottom place, their own hospital bed, so to speak. Would you lead them through a similar prayer that you prayed? And, and maybe you're watching and you're like, hey, I, I don't know what the step would be that I would take, but, but I want that relationship with God. I want to begin that journey with God. Maybe you just want to pray this prayer with Chris, nothing magic in the words, but it's an opportunity for you to take that step personally. Would you just lead us in that prayer? Father, we just step into your presence right now in this moment. God, I believe, I know that there are people watching right now, God, that you are calling to yourself right Mm. now. Father, I pray in Jesus' name as they're just listening to this, God, that you just bring to mind all the times you have been with them, all the times you have been calling them to yourself, Lord. I pray that you just wash your presence over them right now in Jesus' name. And if you feel that presence right now, if you feel like God is calling your name, will you just pray this with me uh, unto the Lord? Father, I surrender to you. I hear your voice, God, and I answer. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross for me, God. Thank you that you died so that I may live. And God, despite all that I've done, despite everywhere I've been, Lord, I just ask to be made whole in you right now, Lord. I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior, Father. And I surrender and commit to following you to the best of my ability from this moment on. Father, I love you and I thank you for calling me here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you made that decision first, it's the best decision of your life. It's an opportunity to go from death to life, to be rescued. And I just want to, we would so love to pray with you, to celebrate with you. There's a number on your screen. Would you just text us the word surrender and let us know that you made that decision? Would you just take that step? Look, you've taken this step. You've been drawn by the Lord, and now this is an opportunity to take another step toward him by taking a step toward his people. We need each other, and we would love to pray for you. We would love to celebrate with you. Text that number on the screen, the word surrender, and we'll follow up letting you know we're going to continue to pray for you. Wow. Thank you for sharing your story today, Chris. Appreciate that so much. Hey, I think Silicon Valley is full of Chris Evans, full of people who are looking to make that decision and looking to respond to Jesus. I just want to say this, Calvary Church, if we're serious about introducing Silicon Valley to Jesus, then we must, if we want to be effective, make the message of grace most evident in our church and in our lives individually. Listen, at the end of the day, the most important call we have is to distribute his grace. Paul was so laser focused on this throughout his life. We must also be that laser focused on it in our lifetime, in our generation. This is our moment. We have been given a vision, but we have a personal responsibility. There is no plan B. We are it, and we are never more attractive than when we're giving God's grace to the undeserving. Turns out we are all undeserving, but because of Jesus, we are all worthy. This is our calling. I want to give you these final four questions, and I want to pray with you before we close today. First question, when people who are far from God act like people who are far from God, Do you find in yourself a tendency to separate, to criticize, and to judge? Or do you pray and love? And where's the grace? On which side would you gravitate? Number two, what desires or thoughts are you struggling with in this season? Number three, Are you living each day from love or for love? 
we were told in verse 4 that because of his great love, God makes us alive. The reality is you don't have to wonder if you're loved. He's proven his love. He continues to draw you and me to himself. He loves us so much. Do we begin each day? Do we live each day from his love or for love? Number four, who do you know? Who do you know that is yet to be made alive in Christ because of his grace? I suspect just like Chris had people who reached out to him, you have people in your life that you could reach out to. And here's what I would challenge you to do. If God brings someone's name to your mind, would you just begin to pray for them? And then I would ask you to to make your prayer very specific and ask God to not only save them with his grace, but to use you in the process. That's our greatest calling. Finally, I want to close with a prayer. In fact, it's a prayer for today, for our entire church. This is my prayer for Calvary Church. And it's a prayer I want to adapt based on what Paul just shared here in Ephesians chapter 2. But it's an ancient prayer. It's a prayer written by St. Patrick 1,700 years ago. And it's our prayer for this season. Would you let me pray it? Today, would you join me in this prayer? Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right and Christ on my left. Christ when I lay down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I rise up. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of anyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eyes of anyone who sees me. And Christ in the ears of anyone who hears me. May Christ increase and we decrease in this valley, for your glory, God. Amen and amen. Calvary Church, I hope you have a great week. We so look forward to seeing you next week. If you would like to encourage someone with this service, would you just go ahead and share it with them today? We'll look forward to seeing you next week right here at 10 o'clock as we continue with part three of our series, Rebuilding, as we go through the book of Ephesians. Have a great week. God bless you.